Hi guys, Nick Thomas here at the Academy of Historical Fencing. Sabres. Real sabres have curves, but how much? And how much is good? Uh, now first of all, why do real sabres have curves? Um, that is a matter of the English language for you, because the term sabre is used a little more openly in some cultures. Um, you'll see, some, for example, the French can use sabre a little bit more uh, openly for different swords, and American military swords for that, for that matter. Um, but in English, sabre referred to a curved blade. And if you look back to some sort of old dictionaries and you go back to some definitions going sort of um, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, going into the 19th, sabre is always described as a curved blade and it usually has a description along the lines of a scimitar or falchion curved sword. Now I'm going to go on to that term scimitar and uh, things like that in a bit. Um, but yeah, so in English, a sabre is a curved blade, and that is an extreme example which I'm also going to be talking about in this video. So I'm going to discuss how much curvature sabres do have, how we measure it, how it varies through different cultures, and to some degree how it affects the fight as well, because I've done a lot of experimentation with curvatures of, of different amounts. Um, so um, a while back I posted a video uh, called Sparring with an Outrageously Curved Sabre, and it was very popular, but it also got a lot of people saying that's not outrageously curved, that's the Polish way, that's the Eastern way, you know, blah blah blah. And also some comments of, you only know British swords. Um, and you might think that, okay, I'm British, I study British military sabre, and therefore I might be absolutely obsessed with British military swords and British military sabres. Yes, I am. But I also love a huge variety of swords. So I might collect more British military swords than non-British military swords, but I love a huge variety of swords, and I do train with a lot of different swords. I mean, okay, so yes, I study um, British military sabre, but then most of all, the other stuff I study is Italian and German. So I'm not specific to um, uh, British stuff, and I do love non-European swords as well. <laughs> um, I'm not anti-non-European swords. And that is important, because if we're going to talk about sabre, we need to get out of Northern Europe, um, because that's not where they started. Um, anyway. Let's talk about amount of curve, and to talk about the amount of curve, we have to talk about how you measure it, because you've got to have um, a standard methodology to measure in. And the problem is, is that a lot of people, when they start talking about curvature, is they find the straight point of a blade, and then they measure out how far it goes from here to here, basically straight line there to there, which is not the normal way to measure a um, curvature of a blade, and there are some problems with measuring that way. Largely that um, the shape and the cant of grips can vary, and that therefore is not an accurate representation of what the curvature of the blade itself is, because what's happening down here can, can alter that measurement, and you don't want to be doing that. Uh, it's an interesting one to actually look at, is how it curves compared to the cant and things like that, the grip, but we're talking about curvature of the blade itself. Uh, now, how you measure the curvature of a blade is you put a straight line from the point to the shoulder, so that's the back of the blade where it meets the guard. So straight line from there to there, and then we measure the widest point from the back of the blade to that imaginary line. Now, that widest point, depending on the shape of the blade, depending on the curvature of the blade, it could be in the middle, it could be further towards the end, it depends where it starts curving, and then how the curve basically varies throughout the sword. And some sabres curve fairly evenly, some start straight and then curve, um, like a lot of killich, for example, so they can vary at the widest point, and normally we don't worry about that too much with curvature, we just talk about what is the widest point of curvature. Uh, so that's the standard measure. And to give you an idea, this is extreme. This is 10 centimetres of curvature, um, which is massive. Now. The sword that I posted the sparring video for, which was the ridiculously curved sabre sparring, is this one. And this is a training sword I have made that also has 10 centimetres of curvature. And although this one is fullered, that's purely done for a bit of weight reduction whilst keeping a, a wide edge. Um, it's designed to be roughly the same kind of sword as this, even though it's a bit bigger. But it's very much the same style, and um, where that comes from is the British had in um, Egypt, the Egyptian campaign against the French um, around 1800s of 1801 uh, were influenced by the shamshirs that were being used out there. 
Um, and that's why you end up with a trend um, for these unfullered, extremely curved swords. And the French did it as well. It was never the norm, it wasn't sort of regulation, it wasn't common, but it was a, if you like, a large trend, a large minority trend for um, particularly infantry and cavalry, and specifically like cavalry officers, to carry outrageously um, curved blades that often weren't exactly well suited to the style of combat that they were doing as well. Doesn't mean they weren't good swords, but they were not suited to the way that Europeans were fighting at the time. And I'm also going to go on to that in a bit. Um, so, this is extreme curve. And one of the things people talk about with that, I think, well, okay, that's extreme curve. And again, people say, no, that's kind of the Polish way, it's the Hungarian way, etc. Um, that's not quite true. And that is, as I said, um, because um, people tend to be measuring in different ways, measuring the curvature in different ways. So let's now take a look at um, something like this. This is one of the most famous um, sabres in, sort of, um, in Britain and largely Northern European history, and that is the 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre. You'll come across it any way you look about sabres in Northern Europe, if you like, because it is incredibly famous. It's been copied many times over. Um, so yeah, the Light Cavalry Sabre, and this type of sabre would commonly now be called the Hussar Sabre. Um, and it, it really caught on heavily in Europe in the, sort of, um, in the 18th century, and, and it remained very, very popular for a good while. And it's characterised by a deeply curved blade that is very broad. And it's also um, very narrow, narrow in terms of distal taper. So it's very wide at the width here, narrow, very narrow here. So it's not necessarily as heavy as you might think it is. It's, it's a good chopper, a very heavy chopper. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's heavy without being a monster. Um, and this really is kind of typical, even though it's British, it's really typical of Eastern European sabres. Um, the kind of thing that you were using, in, they were using in Poland and Hungary and that kind of thing. Um, and this has 5.75 centimetres of curve. Now, if you look to a book like this, this is an excellent book for looking at the curvature of sabres, because if you look to most museum websites, collections and things like that, or even any books on the subject, you're almost never going to see any measurements on the curve. In fact, you're lucky if you even get weights um, and, and uh, lengths of blade. You're lucky to get that with most books and most museums. Um, they're starting to get better on it, but it's still difficult. But this book, which is in Polish, and I don't speak Polish, but I have lots of friends that do, um, Szabla, Sabre. Um, so this book by um, uh, Wojciech Soblowski um, goes through page by page an absolute ton of original sabres. Um, and it's very heavily focused on Polish and, and Hungarian to a degree, but it also has um, lots of sort of um, the Shamshir types, the Mameluk sabres like I was talking about um, uh, at the start of the video. And page by page it's just one sabre with several illustrations loads of information in foreign, yes, in Polish, um, and it gives weights, balances, measures, and specifically it gives curve on almost every sword that's in here. So this book is just rammed with the examples of original swords, and specifically, because it's not all about Polish sabres, but it's by a Polish man who likes a lot of Polish sabres, so it has an awful lot of them in there, um, as well as others. And if you look through, it's kind of typical to see most Polish sabres in there are between about four and eight centimetres of curve, which is a lot of curve, as they talked about with the light cavalry, but it's not the outrageously curved ten centimetres. Um, now, you will undoubtedly find a Polish sabre with ten centimetres of curve. What I'm saying is it wasn't common. Um, you can go through a load of museum examples and you're going to see the kind of typical Eastern European Hazard type sabres are generally four to, even four to seven, but four to eight centimetres is about really, um, really common. So um, if I go on to something a little bit more extreme, this is uh, another light cavalry sword, but this is an officer's or a yeomanry version, and they varied in terms of specification because they didn't have to exactly meet the regulation in the way that the standard trooper sword did. So this one, 6.75 centimetres of curve, and therefore it's kind of really typically in the Polish range, even though it's not a Polish sabre. But if you gave this to a Pole in the 17th or 18th century, he'd go, nah, yeah, 
Shabla. Um, he'd recognise it instantly, it would be nothing strange to him, apart from the fact that in the 17th century they really liked their film rings, but they did get rid of those fairly quickly as well. Um, so yeah, 6.75 centimetres of curve, so uh, you know, another centimetre on top of what was the regulation for the light cavalry sabre, a sabre that was known to be very curved, it was a deeply curved sabre. Um, so you're talking about an awful lot there. Okay. Um, Let's also look at a few other good examples from the period, because I love Napoleonic sabres. Um, I study from the manuals for, from them and I love the period, so inevitably I love Napoleonic stuff. And this has um, always been pretty much my favourite sabre. Uh, one of the 1803 infantry patterns, uh, carried mostly by the um, light infantry officers, fusilier officers, grenadiers and, and rifle company officers. So it's basically the sword of the elite officer in the British Army on foot. And how much curve does this one have? This one is um, six centimeters. Uh, and I have two examples of this. The other one is a little bit more. I think it's 6.5 centimeters. And the 1803 pattern can vary immensely, actually, because there was no real regulation to the blade. The, the hilt was a regulation, and the blade was kind of left to the individual. So you're going to see a lot of different examples. And I would say this one is roughly average, if slightly under on curvature. Yeah, I would say something like six, seven centimetres is very, very common for these. And, and, and again, the officers carrying them really loved extreme curves. It was a massive fashion of the time. So uh, that is significant. Uh, right. Let's move on. Um, or in fact, no, let's move back. I talked about the Shamshir, the sort of Mamluk sabres, the influence from, uh, from Egypt. And here is an example of a Shamshir. Um, a typically Persian uh, sword, although um, one of the experts on this type of swords has told me that he believes this one is of Indian manufacture um, at the same time uh, of its time because they uh, did also make them and tended to prefer these solid brass hilts. Um, but again, I'm not an expert as such on those, I've got a little bit of knowledge, but um, the point is, is the blade essentially is identical to my British example. So. The British one is just a copy of this style of blade mounted on a typically British or, or um, European hilt. And yes, this one is pretty much bang on, again, 10 centimetres of curvature, which is that outrageous amount of curvature, far more than the typical Hazar sabres that are known to be really heavily curved. Now, um, on to something else, another of the famous curved blades, uh, very famous, the Talwa or Talwa, and this is kind of the iconic Indian blade. Um, the Indians are very, very famous for the talwar usage and very, very effective with them, and known to have kept them very sharp and, um, and very effective and very powerful cuts with them. Uh, right, the, this talwar is um, six centimetres of curve. Again, historical examples vary quite a lot. My other one, my other example is 6.5, but you can still see that most of the towers I've seen are in the range, again, of most Hazar sabres. They're in that four to eight centimetre range. So that's kind of covering, not all again, because I'm not talking about every type of every sword ever made, but the common examples, and I've seen a lot. Talwars, I've probably now handled, I don't know, 50, 60 examples and seen photos of loads and loads more um, and seen lots in museums. And the same goes for the types of Hazar sabres that I've seen an awful lot of. So I'm talking about the kind of norms across the board. Uh, and now let's get into the 19th century. Sabres in the 19th century tended to, um, from very early on, start getting an awful lot straighter. Uh, and that is because there's a greater emphasis on point work. And they wanted to use more and more thrust work. And a straighter sword is a bit better for thrust work. And I will talk a little bit more about that in another video in terms of how straight and curved blades work for thrust work. Certainly if you're going to use thrust work um, with this kind of sword in the way that the Northern Europeans were using them, well, just Europeans, um, you want a fairly straight sword. And this one is actually a cavalry length but on an infantry hilt and it's um, got one centimetre of curve. One centimetre, that's all. So um, that is really typical of a British sabre um, post-Napoleonic, basically uh, 1820s onwards up until the end of the 19th century. Um, and to show you a few more like that, that is um, an 1885 pattern, um, 
British Trooper Sword, which has 1.5 centimeters of curve, um, and a British Rifle Officer's Sword from the late 19th century um, that has uh, one centimeter or, or a whisker under. And that's the general trend. Now, obviously, I'm showing you a lot of British swords compared to, proportionally compared to the other stuff. But I'm also talking about, as I did say, a huge number of other examples from other cultures that I've seen through museums um, that I've uh, handled, seen at auction houses, and that kind of thing. So, um, what I would say is this, is how the kind of averages break down. When you get into the 19th century, and sabres are quite lightly curved, they usually tend to be between about one and two centimetres of curve. So those are your much more thrust-centric sabres. When you're looking at the Hazard-type sabres, which are known to be heavily curved, and tulwars and things like that, um, it goes into that sort of four to eight centimetre range. And when you get to the really extreme of things like the Shamshir, and on average a Shamshir is much more curved than a typical, say, Hungarian or Polish sabre, or realistically a sabre from most places in the world. Shamshir is is very, very um, curved, and there are some other um, very curved Eastern swords and Middle Eastern swords. Um, so there are other examples, but yeah, the Shamshir is one of the most famous. Um, you get the Pulwar and things like that. Um, you get up to the roughly 10 centimetre range of curvature, and you can go beyond that. You can get into some ridiculous 15, 20 centimetre levels of curve, but they are incredibly rare examples, incredibly rare. So when you get to 10 centimetres, it is a massive amount of curvature. Now, um, yes, going back to the term of um, scimitar. This is a shamshir. Scimitar, shamshir, they sound very similar. There's a reason they sound similar. It's because scimitar is a, um, an English term for the whole family of essentially Middle East and, and uh, Eastern sabres. It essentially is a, a, a yeah, Eastern or Middle Eastern sabre. Um, so, or, or sort of Oriental sabre, they might say, in, you know, historically to some degree as well. And it's not a very good term. Scimitar is a term you find throughout the uh, 17th, 18th and 19th century in regard to for these kind of foreign um, sabres. And it's generally not a very useful term whereas we tend to now use the more specific terms to the type of swords under that whole umbrella, because it is a really broad umbrella term, and we now use things like Talwar Shamshir. So that's the scimitar term um, sorted out. Now, going back to... Um, I talked about how you measure curve, typical examples, and now I'd like to say a bit about how it affects the fight. Obviously, my fighting style for sabre is based around British military sabre. Um, in the British military system, they used everything from, at that time, straight blades all the way up to this um, Persian um, um, Shamshir-inspired blades with massive amounts of curvature. And they probably shouldn't have, according to regulations, but they did. So they had everything from straight up to about 10 centimetres of curvature, which is a vast amount of difference straight to 10 centimetres of curve is a big difference in a sword. Is it a good thing or not to have that much curve? I would definitely say no, according to the style that we use. If you look at the um, style of swordsmanship in use in the Napoleonic period with Northern Europeans, it was using the lunge as the primary attack. And the lunge is really not at all suited to a blade with this much, cur much curvature. It's unwieldy. It's hard to land the point um, in that fashion, um, and some of the straighter cuts are just much harder to land because the curvature of the blade just takes it off. And the description of how these were used um, in sort of Egypt is with very close um, draw-through cuts, which are using the edge to, to deliver really wicked um, slices. And that is not the style in use um, in Northern Europe. So this much curvature, curvature is not a bad design. That is not what I'm saying at all. Um, but it's not well suited to the style that we use. It's not well suited to the British officers who bought them. For fashion sense, they just let, let the, the fashion get the better of them in that regard. Um, so what would I consider to be a good level of curvature? Now, some of this depends on how much you want to cut and how much you want to thrust, and also how you want to do your thrust and things like that. Um, curved blades can do some sneaky thrust in, but 
Again, if you're doing lunge-based fencing, too much curve is a problem. And I've now got sabers, um, training sabers that range from uh, one centimeter of curvature. I've got um, five, six, seven and a half, that is, and 10 centimeters. So I've got a nice range, and I've had a few of those historically, and I use straight blades as well. So I will give my impression on how I think it works for the um, see, British military system and the kind of stuff that's being used in Northern Europe. I would say the perfect is about five centimeters. Or, or, and you could go a bit less will be fine, I mean, you, well, you can go straight, that's fine, straight saw is no problem for, for thrust work for that kind of style. But I would say up to 5 centimetres is absolutely great. And the minute you get to kind of the 7-ish range, so you're talking about a lot of the Hazar type sabres, then really not good for that lunge based thrust fencing. Uh, so I think the absolutely ideal for the kind of stuff I teach is yeah, up to about 5 centimetres, maybe 6. 6 would be okay. And you see some of the 1803 swords that I love, they do go up to six and seven centimeters, again, because the fashion trend pushed them that far. So, um, there's a good amount about curvature. Uh, if you've got any questions, please do um, post in the comments section. There's 10 centimeters of curvature. I said it's sparring with an extreme curved sailor. It really is sparring with an extreme curvature. So yes, you'll find those examples in Poland and Hungary, wherever else, but they weren't the norm. If you look at sabers across the world, the overall trend is for um, sabers between sort of one and six centimeters is really common. The seven and eight stuff is the extreme, or, uh, or, or no, not the extreme, but certainly sort of far less common. And then you get over into the ten centimeter range, it is really, really extreme. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any more questions, please fire away. Um, there are so many examples of sabers throughout history, and you know it's one of the most commonly used swords in history. There will always be loads of examples outside the norm, but. Um, I hope I've given a good overview of the kind of stuff that was used throughout history. And uh, yeah, if you've got any more stats and things like that from other swords, other museums and other cultures, please post it in the comments section because it can be really, really interesting. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so.